Okay, so before we move to this room, let me very briefly summarize, if I can, uh, what we're talking about. Did anybody try to summarize in my absence? No, okay. Um, I'll try to do this in two minutes. We are, we are looking at structure, structure of words and sentences. And by structure, I mean the way parts are put together to form a whole and their relations among the parts and between the parts of the whole. That's what I mean. And so, for example, I can talk about the structure of my hand, uh, the whole hand and fingers and so on. These are, I can talk about it because there are these pieces, this piece and this piece and so on. And uh, I don't mean structure in the sense of protein structure, which means shape of the protein. Okay. Protein ha also has parts, uh, but quite often when people say structure, they mean the, the shape, the form. Okay, and in terms of this notion, there is a structure of sounds, structure of means, and then some kind of abstract structure that we call syntax that mediates between these two. I'm not going to go into the details of these because I'm taking some time. But let's just keep this as kind of skeletal pegs on which we'll proceed. These are the three, three dimensions or aspects of structure that we're interested in. Um, in addition, we also have levels of structure or hierarchies of structure, uh, such as word, sentence, and uh, larger than sentence, such as paragraphs or larger things, and what you might call word parts that linguists call morphemes. So the word unhappy consists of the piece un and the piece happy. These are called morphemes. The word voice consists of boy and s. The word goodness consists of good and ness. Those are the things that we call morphemes. Again, you don't have to know in great detail what these things mean. This is just a kind of very rough sketch. So there are these things like, just as we say, for example, there are molecules, cells, uh, tissues, organs, organisms, etc., which are of this type larger and larger units, we have these levels. And each of these things have this three-dimensional structure. And it is that structure that we are interested in. And we have laws that govern each of those. So there is a bunch of laws governing sounds at each of these levels, different laws. And there are also laws that govern the relation between these the relation between meanings and syntax, syntax and sounds, sounds and meanings. Uh, linguists, by their very nature, are law seekers, like they're like physicists. The only way of doing linguistics of this type would be to discover more and more laws. That's a kind of obsession for linguists. In this, in this obsession, linguists are very different from biologists. Biologists like models, not laws. Linguists also do some models, but you know, the whole enterprise is constructing laws. And you create models only because we need some region, some world to inhabit the laws. We also do another thing. We construct representations. So you could, in fact, summarize the whole of the enterprise of studying language structure in terms of constructing representations and constructing laws governing those representations. A representation is something like a map. Okay. So uh, you could say something like if you have a word like decentralization, you could say there is center, there is al, there is eyes and nation, and there is e, and if you have center and al together will give you Central, and then uh, you have central, centralized, and then decentralized, and decentralization. What I've done here, in terms of this picture, is give you a representation of the structure of this one. 
and this is done in terms of in graph theoretic terms. So there are ways of converting the structure into uh, different kinds of graphs. Uh, graph in the sense of network, like vertices and edges and so on, not the statistical graphs. So there are these different kinds of graph theoretic representations along these di different dimensions of structure, and we construct those representations, construct the laws. That's what the game is about. Okay. This is just a kind of introduction to the culture of theoretical linguistics. Okay. Any quick questions about? Right. Um, okay. What I want to do now is to take you through a few cases of this enterprise of constructing laws and representations at these different dimensions and levels of representation. So um, if you take a word like sad, you can attach that to this piece called ness, and you get a well-formed word sadness. If you take a similar word, grief, is similar to sad in me, and you try to attach ness to it, griefness is not a possible word. People reject this. Okay, so if you give sadness and griefness side by side, you will say that's okay, but this is bad. And uh, judgment bad is indicated by this. This is a kind of experiment that linguists often engage in. Okay. This is a behavioral experiment. So what that means to say, if you treat humans like rats, you give these two stimuli, and they say, okay, to this stimuli, they're happy. This stimulus, they, they are unhappy. So their behavioral, their responses to these two stimuli are different. There is an asymmetry in the responses. Okay. Um, and then we want to explain why. Why do they behave in these two different ways? So let me explain, in this particular case, this is judgment behavior. Uh, and the one is acceptable and the other is unacceptable. This is one of the, the distinction between acceptable and unacceptable forms. It's one of the main sources of evidence in constructing theories in linguistics. There are other kinds of behavioral asymmetries. This is one of the most important ones. So this is acceptable, this is not ac acceptable. The same way you have uh, happy, and you can attach nest to it, you get happiness, but you have joy, and you attach nest, and you don't. Joyness doesn't, is unacceptable. Okay, and you can collect large number of these experimental asymmetries, and the question is how do you explain this? Linguists explain things by constructing, as I said, constructing representations and laws. So let me show you how we do that. You say sad. Sad is a noun, and then you attach nest to it. Sorry, <laughs> sad. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Whenever I say noun, I mean an adjective. <laughs> Unless I, I don't mean it. <laughs> OK. In contrast, if you say uh, grief, grief is a noun. And then when you attach, okay, that doesn't work. Likewise, if you say happy, happy is an adjective, and you can attach nest, where joy is a noun, and then you attach nest, doesn't work. So now the moment you construct this representation, it becomes clear what, what's going on. You can't attach this guy to this guy. Okay. This is a very simple straightforward rule that 10 year old kids can figure out. So you write a law like this. Law, we say, ness uh, 
cannot be attached to nouns. Okay. Uh, this, not, this is not like an E is equal to MC squared type of law. It, it applies only to little things, not the big law. But we begin with small laws and then construct these big laws. Laws that work on other laws and so on. Now, one of the characteristic things in the culture of linguistics is the moment somebody writes a law, somebody else comes up and says, but why can't I do it with some other kind of law? This is another obsessive compulsive behavior of linguists. So somebody is going to say, why formulate it this way? Why don't I formulate it by ness uh, can be attached only to adjectives. That works equally well, right? So the, the next step is to figure out which law to choose. If you have two competing laws, you must make a choice. Okay? I'm, I'm saying it in this particular way because I want to introduce you to a different culture. These are the compulsive habits of linguists that distinguish them from other creatures, many other creatures. Philosophers have similar characteristics. Physicists, a little bit, not, not to such obsession. Because when physicists find some kind of law, they stick to it. They don't want to think of alternative laws. Linguists must be uh, compulsive uh, alternative seekers. So how do you uh, choose between them? Well, you have to find other kinds of data. So there is a difference in the prediction between these two. In, in this case, it works equally well. But suppose you uh, take an adverb. This one says if you take an adverb and try to attach ness, it will be bad. Whereas this one says nothing. It only says you can't attach it to nouns. It doesn't say anything about adverbs. It doesn't say anything about uh, uh, other kinds of things. Okay. So verbs doesn't say anything about it. So uh, how about sadly? Can you say sadliness? No, you can't. Okay. So that means this one will explain why sadliness is, uh, is bad, but this one doesn't. So you choose this one. And the principle here is, if one law can explain many things, and some other law explains only a proper subset, you choose the one that explains maximum number of things. It's a principle of generality. So that's a kind of uh, epistemology. By epistemology, I mean the uh, principles of knowledge construction that we use. So simplicity and generality, in addition to making correct predictions, uh, are the three uh, crucial criteria for theory construction in linguistics. Any? So, yeah. for such laws, what are the criteria for rejection? Incorrect prediction is one. One. Yes, one. Uh, the other, so if something is, is something makes incorrect predictions, you have to throw out the modified law. Yeah, but there can be exceptions. Exception. So um, when do you say that there is a law and there are exceptions, and when do you reject the law? Right. Uh, if, if you have an exception, you have to list the exception. Right? If, it is, if an exception is infinite in number, if it is not listable, then it doesn't work. That's one. So if it is two or three cases, you can say these are the cases. For example, take uh, the, uh, past, uh, the uh, past tense formation. Usually we form past tense by attaching an ED. But you don't do that with go. You don't say go. You don't say by and by. But these, the words which do not take ED, you can list and say these are the exception cases. So if you can list them, small finite number, that's OK. If you cannot list, no, they're not exceptions. And by and large, people don't like exceptions. Um, uh, the way people deal with exceptions is to come up with some other kind of law which counters the existing law. So there are ways of. Um, ways of avoiding uh, statement of exceptions. Stating exceptions is supposed to be ugly. So a beautiful theory doesn't have any ugliness. That's the whole idea. 
That's the aesthetics. Of course, the other strategy would be to pretend that the counterexamples do not exist. You, know, you look some other way. But that's, a, that's not the norm. That's the practice. OK, let me show you how the laws now interact. So we, cho we chose this law. And we abandoned that one. Now take something like um, joyless. Okay. But if you say um, happiness, that's bad. This is the other case, the opposite case. Well, you write uh, the following law. This is law one. And law two says that less can be attached only to uh, nouns. So here you say it can be attached only to adjectives. And here you say it can be attached only to nouns. Now you put the two together, you get a prediction. Something that you didn't have earlier, namely, a word to which you can attach one of them will not be attachable to the other. That wasn't present in our earlier when we formulated the laws, but the moment you have two laws or more, in, if they interact, new predictions are formed without actually saying anything further. This is the, these are the logical consequences of the interaction between laws. And you check those things. Is it true? Well, if you take a large number of words, you will find that that prediction is correct. So you test those predictions. If the predictions turn out to be wrong, then of course you have to go back and clean up the mess. Uh, take another one, happy and happily. But joy, joy leaves back. Okay. Well, you write the third law. Uh, less can be attached only to adjectives. Notice I'm following the same only to rather than cannot be attached to format. The way you state laws is extremely important. Right? Cannot be attached to x, or can be attached only to y. These are important distinctions. And right now, I have uh, written these laws in ordinary words. There are ways of writing these laws in some formulas, but I'm not going to do that right now. Um, now, notice that once again, Given these two laws, now you get a new prediction. Namely, anything to which you can attach less will also take less, and vice versa. No, no, sorry. The less, uh, yeah, whenever I say less, I mean okay. And you can now check the prediction. Uh, and you'll also get, if you can attach me, then you can attach less, and vice versa. So notice that the moment you have three laws, you have a large number of predictions coming. If you have four, many more, and so on. So it's, it's those effects, the prediction that come out of the logical consequences of the interaction between laws, that uh, make the theory justified. So notice, for example, uh, you could have restated this by saying, nest cannot be attached to uh, nest can be attached. Sorry, nest cannot be attached to uh, joy. Nest cannot be attached to etc. etc. Right? You can list those things without using things like nouns, things like adjectives. But if you do that, at the, set the constraints on individual words, you don't get any of the predictions that I talked about. If you have only one law then categories like nouns and verbs are unnecessary, in fact, because you have to say that happy, somewhere you have to say happy is an adjective, joy is a noun, that you have to list it, list in the, in the lexicon. 
it's only then that these doors would work. Did I go too, too fast on that? Is this okay? Yeah. What's that? Lexicon. Oh, sorry. Lexicon is a kind of mental dictionary. So the idea here is that when you learn a language, you also have to learn the representation that this is an, this is an adjective. And this is stored in your memory, part of your language memory. And you, you are able to speak a language because you have stored these items. You have to store the pronunciation of happy as a, e. These are not derivable, right? These are things that you have to list or stipulate in your mind. And the idea is that you minimize the kinds of things that you stipulate in your mind and you deduce as much as possible. There are certain things that you cannot avoid. So whether happy is an adjective or a noun or an ad adverb, that is idiosyncratic to that particular word. Whether happy begins with a her sound or a per sound, there is no way of deducing it. But other things you can deduce. So anything that you can deduce, you do not list. So lexicon is simply a list of idiosyncratic properties of the morphemes that you have to remember. That is that clear? Okay. So listing, notice that in this, in this culture, listing things, including uh, exceptions, etc., is, is to be minimized. The best theory is one in which you, you list the fewest possible things and get everything through deduction. So the smallest the number of your stipulations and the widest your number of correct predictions. That's the, that's the best thing. Any other questions? Okay. Um, this is the this is the happy part of doing predictions, but this is not the way it normally works. All these predictions are very nice. Okay, um, you get a law saying ed and ing can be attached only to verbs, right? Sleep, slept, whatever, and sleep sleeping, and you get. <coughs> Uh, things like the plural, S, right? Like boy, boys, can be attached only to uh, nouns. So what that means is that if you can attach ed to something, then you cannot attach S to the same thing, right? So for if you can say um, something like uh, <coughs> destroy. You cannot attach the, the, well, S is also plural, so that doesn't quite work, but it doesn't matter. Uh, the, when I say S, the plural, S, and this is the past tense, and this ing is the verb for me. But that is not, sometimes that is not the case. So for example, take measure, and you can say three measures, and you can attach the plural marker. Uh, you can also say measuring. Yes, that's the solution for this problem. But the moment you do that, if you allow a verb can be both, a verb can have many categories. What happened to predictions? There are no predictions anymore, right? That prediction works only when we assume that every word has the same category. A word has a single category, not multiple categories. Huh, that's an addition assumption. Right, without that, you cannot deduce these predictions. So the question is, if you allow a theory to have a single word with multiple categories, how do you allow this but getting the right results for the other cases? There are some predictions to be made, but you should be able to make those predictions without this, without this complication. It's not, it's not terrible, there is a way of doing it. There is still a prediction that you get, namely, uh, you have a measure verb, and you have measure noun, 
Yeah. And if there is something to which you can, that can be attached only to nouns, and there is something that can be attached only to verbs, you can't attach both at the same time. Okay. So for example, take the definite article verb, which requires a noun. That will go here. Okay. Now the plural marker S will go here, but not uh, the past tense marker. Because this means that this has to be noun, this means it has to be a verb, so there's a conflict. And oh, but then major becomes an adjective, and then you can have the major. Ah, yeah, yeah. Then you have to have another song and dance about those things. <laughs> the analysis becomes slightly more and more complicated. So then you have to have a theory. Uh, you have to have a slightly full-blown theory. So none of these individual predictions actually work in, in the kind of toy grammar. It's only when you put together all those complex phenomena under a single theory. Then you get these predictions. The kind of predictions that I just illustrated with two laws, you always have complications. But when you have a complex phenomena, and you have large number of laws, interacting laws, then your freedom gets reduced considerably. So that is, it. that is what I would like to illustrate, how the analysis of complex phenomenon reduces your freedom, and a good theory is one which gives you no freedom whatsoever. Okay, let's kind of pause there. Um, yeah. Is the difference between the two laws that you just example, you cannot put S in front of a verb. That does not make any semantic sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the other one, happy sorry, happy less makes semantic sense. So it could make semantic. There is there is some semantics involved in both. So for example, in that attached plural marker, the meaning is more than one. When you attach ed, the meaning is something that took place in the past, right? So, but it is not a semantic law. The law is purely syntactic. So what you're looking for is the difference between purely syntactic laws which are arbitrary when it comes to meanings, and meaning laws which are arbitrary when it comes to syntax and so on. I'll give you examples of those things. Quite often there is a kind of harmony between syntax and semantics. But there are also things which are, uh, in terms of meaning, they are strange. So if I were to speak like a biologist, I would say, these are not evolutionarily motivated because they stand against communication. They prevent communication. And language has many of those crazy, crazy things, which shouldn't be there, but they exist. Okay. Um, I, I may have, when I move from there to here, I may have taken a few things for granted. Um, I kind of lost my balance when I moved because I wasn't, <laughs> I didn't want to bore the people who were sitting in that room, nor did I want to confuse the people who were not sitting in that room. So if there are questions, do ask me. You can also ask me questions on email. So have, is everyone's email here? This is not attendance, this is simply for email. I want to create a discussion for you. Okay, so two things. One, we'll meet on Thursdays, 5.30, and it'll be here. Okay. Right. So unless there are questions, then... No, I have one question. Hmm. In that room, uh, you would say that the meanings could be of the grammatical and one is the word. Yeah. Now that word is what? Uh, hmm. Is that uh, is something arbitrariness kind of a thing? Or, uh, no, word we have meaning and the word meaning are the same? Or is this different? No, the, the, the grammatical meanings are abstractions of the word. But not all word meanings are abstract into language. So for example, as I said, the distinction between one and more than one is part of the world. However, we restrict it to one, two, and more than two. You can't have more than that. Likewise, you have the distinction between encoding past, present, future as part of the world. But you don't encode things like uh, degrees of length, for example, or color. These are not encoded dramatically. 
the distinction between states and processes, uh, between process and actions. These are all things which are encoded. So there's a small number of things. Negation is encoded. But there is a huge number of meanings which exist in the world, but are not encoded in language. So we'll, with that, that, those are the kinds of things that I want to go into uh, in this course. The, the notion of grammatical meanings versus other kinds of meanings. Uh, because one of the reasons is that is, it is that distinction that uh, led to the design of this course. So I want to go back to that in detail. You talk about behavioral experiments, uh, so you just you look at judgment. So these judgments can be transient with time. Yeah. So I mean, ten years ago, the word the word selfie would not. Yeah, yeah. Would yeah. Be in fact, it is it's transient with respect to not even like ten years ago in in uh, the whole Spatial, community. Yes. Uh, there is variability in all kinds of ways. For example, two people from the same family can have different judgments. Okay, and this is now it is it wasn't imagined about uh, 30 years ago but now it is well known that such cases exist okay and that means that the, 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 the I use the word grammar the grammars that people have in their minds are not identical in the same language so my brother's grammar of Malayalam and my grammar of Malayalam are in fact significantly different but you will notice that only if you probe into the structure using these experimental techniques. That's one. The other is your judgments also change over time, even the individuals. So my judgments 10 years ago, 15 years ago are not the judgments now. So they, they, they keep changing. And the, but the interesting part is certain kinds of judgments are very robust. They do not change. Certain other kinds of judgments change. So the interesting question is why is it some parts are resistant to change and they are persistent while others are not? These are all interesting questions to ask. So uh, the tradition of linguistics that I belong to would say the only reality is the individual's grammar and the species grammar. In between there are things like the community grammar, by which I mean things like the grammar of English, the grammar of Malayalam, the grammar of French, etc. There are people, people like Noam Chomsky would say that's a meaningless thing. There is no such thing as the grammar of English. That's an illusion. And we shouldn't be studying such things. But then there are others who would say that is also a reasonable enterprise to try, though difficult. So we study grammars, at least I study grammar at the level of the individual grammar, at the level of the community grammar, at the level of the species grammar. That's the, that's the enterprise. But the, the variability problem that you pointed out is huge and we have to find ways of dealing with variability. This is about the same actually as in biology. 